I've recorded this PowerPoint just to try and help my students to revise for the GCSE Unit 2 for AQA. I've split the unit up into three, so this first part is all about forces and motion. Okay, the first thing you need to know is the equation for speed. And you must remember that speed is always in meters per second. So you have the distance in meters and the time in seconds and convert it to that if it's not given to you on the exam. Remembering it in this triangle will help you to rearrange it. So being able to put the equations in the triangle will help you. You have about eight equations. You don't need to learn them. Don't spend a lot of time learning them. But you do need to put them in triangles and possibly rearrange them. This triangle works like this. If you cover over S for speed, you're left with D divided by T, which is this equation here. If you want to know what distance is, distance is speed times time. Speed times time is distance. And finally, if you want to know what T is, cover over T, you're left with D divided by S, which is distance divided by speed. Okay, you need to know all about distance time graphs and speed time graphs. The distance time graphs are slightly easier, so I'm just going to draw one here for you to have a look at and consider. So if you look at this first section here, you can see it starts at a distance of 0 and goes up to 10 in 20 seconds. Because it's a straight line, it means it's got a steady speed. So a steady speed from 0 to 10 meters. The second section is a horizontal line. All horizontal lines will mean that it stays at the same distance. So here it's staying at 10 meters, so it's stationary. And then this next section here, you'll see the line is steeper, much, much steeper than the first line. So it means it's a much steeper, it's much faster speed. And this last one, the diagonal line backwards, means that it's going at a steady speed still, because it's a straight line, but it goes back to zero, so it returns back to its original position. So here's a typical kind of question you might get. What is the speed during the first 20 seconds? Well, it's going from 0 to 10 in 20 seconds. So it's 10 meters in 20 seconds. So the answer is 0.5 meters per second. Second question here, how far is the object from the start after 60 seconds? You can look up the graph here. 60 seconds, it is a distance of 40 meters away. The third question, what's the speed during the last 40 seconds? Make sure that you're taking the change in distance, so it's going from 60 to 100 in a time of 40 seconds. So it's 40 meters in 40 seconds, so the answer is 1 meter per second. And the final question there, when was object traveling the fastest? You're looking for the steepest line. The steepest line is between 40 and 60 seconds. Okay, you might have heard of the term speed and velocity. Speed is simply how fast you are traveling, so a car here might be traveling at a speed of 20 meters per second. If you want to describe the velocity of the same car, you need to indicate the direction. So you need to add the plus sign on there, if we're saying plus is that way. If the car was going in the opposite direction, but the same speed, although it's got the same speed, this would become a minus 20 meters per second. So velocity describes the direction as well as how fast it is actually going. Uh, slightly trickier, acceleration. The equation for the acceleration will be given on the exam, just like the others, but you may want to be able to put it in a triangle. So if you remember that we're looking at change in velocity and use a C and put it there, it becomes a cat triangle, easy to learn. And so if you wanted to work out acceleration, it's given there change in speed or change in velocity over time, and be very careful that the, the units for acceleration is meters per second squared, not meters per second. Um, if you want to rearrange it, cover over C for change in velocity there, you'll get acceleration times time. And if you cover over T, you've got C over A, change in velocity over acceleration. Okay, here's a second type of graph, and uh, I've drawn it so it looks the same shape, but it actually means something completely different. So the first section here, it's a, steep it's a steep line going up from 0 to 40. Because we're looking at velocity, it means it's changing velocity. It's getting faster. And the special word for that means accelerating. So it's accelerating by 0 to 40 in 10 seconds. Um, a, a horizontal line here. On the other graph, it meant stationary, but it now means it's going at a steady velocity of 40. So during this period here, it's traveling at a steady speed, 
of 40 meters per second. You can see the line goes up again here. This means that it's accelerating again till it gets to a maximum speed here of 60 meters per second. And then the line going all the way back down to zero means that it's decelerating. The opposite to accelerating means slowing down until it becomes to rest after 50 seconds. Now, if you're doing the higher tier, you may be asked how far this car has traveled during its journey. And what you must remember is it's the area under the graph. So you can work out the area of that triangle, add it to the area of this rectangle, add it to the area of that rectangle. Here's an exam question you could get on graphs. Well, how fast was the object going after 10 seconds? Go up from 10, you can see it will be going 40 meters per second. What is the acceleration from 20 to 30? Well, the change in speed during that time is 20 meters per second in a time of 10 seconds, so it would be 2 meters per second squared. What is the acceleration from 30 to 50? Change of speed goes from 60 to 0, so it's 60 meters per second change in a time of 20. So 6 divided by 20 would be 3 meters per second squared, and it might be a minus sign to show it's a deceleration. How far did the object travel altogether? You'd have to do it by working out the area under the graph. That would only appear on a higher paper. Okay, let's consider some forces. Let's pick a camel standing on a road. Why not? Here's a camel standing on a road. Like everything on Earth, it has weight. It has a force acting downwards due to gravity. It would fall down if it wasn't for the road pushing back a reaction, which is a force which acts in exactly the opposite direction with the same force, means the camel stays still. What would happen then if the road was taken away, if that reaction wasn't there? Well, the camel would fall downwards. It would free fall downwards because there's nothing to stop it falling. Well, let's, okay, let's consider some cars now. This Mini here, if it starts moving, moving forward, because the engine driving it forward, it will start to accelerate. There is no frictional force, or Aries is when it's going at very, very low speed. But as it builds up speed, you'll find that there'll be a force acting in the opposite direction due to the air resistance, due to the friction. So it tries to slow it down, but at this state, it is still accelerating because you can see the arrow going forward is bigger than the arrow going back. Eventually, the arrows will balance out. They will be equal and opposite. So this Mini now travels at a steady or a constant speed. It needs to keep the force forward to maintain the speed, but the force backwards is the same size in the opposite direction. If the Mini now driver then puts his foot on the brake, takes his foot off the gas, there is no force going forward. The force going backwards brakes will slow him down until eventually he stops. We talked about resultant forces. These are quite easy. You just consider the size of the force and the direction. So this first person here has been pushed in both direction. You can see that this force is bigger by that one. You take one away from the other in this case, so the resultant force would be 400 newtons that way. If you look at the second person, you can see the difference is 100 newtons that way. And here you can have more than, more than one direction. These two 700s would cancel each other out, wouldn't move left or right, but he would move upwards with a force of 200 newtons. And this last one, very similar, you can take the top force and the bottom force away, and it would be pushed up with a force of 50 newtons. That's what's meant by resultant force, the combination of forces. There is an equation that links force and acceleration. Basically, the bigger the force, the bigger the acceleration. So if you look at these two sumo wrestlers, you'll see that the, the one on the left is pushing the other one, bigger arrow there, he's going to accelerate towards the right. To work out the size of the acceleration, you can use this equation. Again, you can put it into a triangle if you want to rearrange it. And the force is actually equal to the mass in kilograms times the acceleration. So a bigger force for a bigger mass with a bigger acceleration. Okay, we're now going to consider a skydiver, somebody jumping from an aeroplane. At first, he jumps out of the aeroplane, there's no air resistance. There is a big force acting downwards due to gravity, his weight pulling him down, so he starts to speed up, he starts to accelerate downwards. After some time, the air resistance takes effect. The air is pushing against him and trying to slow him down, so he doesn't accelerate at the same rate. 
Eventually, that air resistance will balance out. You can see the arrows being the same size. Balance the force out so we'll reach a steady speed, and this is called a terminal velocity. He will not get any faster or any slower. He could get faster if he reduced the air resistance by tucking in his arms. The other thing he can do is obviously pull his parachute, and when he does his parachute, you see the size of this arrow is massive because the surface area of the parachute is big, so it gets a lot of air resistance. This slows him right down. You can see the force upwards is bigger than downwards. So it slows him right down until he reaches another terminal velocity. At this point, he's gone quite slow, and he should be going slow enough, safe enough to land. So here's a graph of his motion. If we plot velocity against time, when he first jumps out the plane, he's not traveling at all. He quickly increases speed, a steady acceleration there shown by a straight line, and eventually he will reach what's called a terminal velocity. So the speed increases and he reaches terminal velocity. And then when he pulls his parachute open, you can see he slows right down and he ends up at a slower terminal velocity, which is slow enough to let him land on the ground. And there he lands on the ground quite safely um, without any injury. If he was on the moon, by the way, there is no gravity on the moon. So therefore, you would just keep accelerating, keep accelerating, because there's nothing to try and slow him down. Okay, there's some more equations that you'll need. Don't learn them. Just no, know about them. And you will be given them on the exam. You may be asked to rearrange them. The relationship between weight and mass is that weight is mass times the gravitational field. And on Earth, it's 10 newtons for every kilogram. That means if you had a mass of 1 kilogram, the weight would be 10 newtons. So a typical mass of a person might be 50, 60 kilograms, means it's 500, 600 newtons on Earth. So if you've got the moon, gravitational field strength on the moon is a lot less, so you weigh a lot less, but your mass is exactly the same. Work done is a term for energy used when a force moves a distance. Another equation here, using the formula, work done is force times the distance moved. Remember, in work done is a type of energy, so it's measured in joules. How many joules it takes to move a certain force a certain distance. Again, you can put it in a triangle, which will help you to rearrange it. The next equation is for higher only. And it's all about kinetic energy, movement energy. An object that moves has a certain amount of kinetic energy. The equation looks quite complicated. And the tip is that if you start at the end, you square the velocity, the speed of the object, multiplied by the mass, multiplied by a half, and it gives you how much kinetic energy that moving object has. And again, it's an energy, all energy is measured in joules. And here's the equation here. You will be given it on the, on the paper. You just need to be able to rearrange it if necessary. Momentum is a concept which is both on the higher and the foundation papers. And it takes into consideration the mass of a moving object and also the velocity it has. The bigger the mass, the bigger the velocity, the larger the momentum. So the equation is quite simple, straightforward. You multiply the mass in kilograms by the velocity, and it gets this thing called momentum. The units being kilogram meters per second, which is mass times velocity. And in a triangle, to rearrange it, you would put it in this triangle here. Momentum is, tells you how hard it is to stop something. So the bigger the mass, the bigger the velocity, the harder it is to stop, and obviously the harder it is to get going. So if you consider a lorry going at the same speed as a car, a lorry has more momentum than the car. It might have the same speed, but a lot more momentum is a lot more massive. It means it's much harder to stop, it means that much more powerful brakes are needed. When you collide things together, the momentum before and after must be the same. And to demonstrate that, if you consider two cars traveling down a motorway, if car first car has a mass of 800 kilograms and a velocity of 20 meters per second, if the second car has a slightly bigger mass and a slightly bigger velocity, so it'll catch it up and collide with it, then the two cars may stick together and will move off at a certain velocity. Now, to work out that velocity, you've got to consider the momentum of this car and the momentum of this car by multiplying the two numbers together. And adding those two together gives you the momentum before, and that will equal to the momentum after. So here you go. This is for higher only. 
Momentum before equals momentum after. That is what's meant by the conservation of momentum. So the cars before have a total momentum of that for this car and that for this car, and add those together, must equal to the mass of them combined, will apply by the velocity after. So quite complicated. You should arrive at an answer of that. I'll stress again that this is for a higher paper only. Um, consider the cars going into opposite directions. Same cars, same velocity. This time you'll see we'll put a minus sign there to show it's going the opposite direction. Now you can actually have a look and see what's going to happen here. This one has more momentum. It's both got more mass and more velocity. Whereas this one's less massive and it's got traveling a small, shorter speed. You can see what's going to happen here. Adding the momentum together comes up with that. Making sure you've got a minus sign to take one away from the other. And therefore afterwards, that momentum must be conserved. So the same momentum afterwards divided by the total mass and you get a speed of that with a plus sign, meaning it moves towards the right if they stick together. Um, common question. You will be asked to consider how to stop a car and what factors will affect the distance a car travel while it's trying to stop. It comes in two parts. First of all, the driver will travel a distance while he's thinking about stopping. This is his reaction time. So he sees something come on the road, it takes a little bit of time before he puts his foot on the brake. And things that can affect this are if he's under the influence of alcohol, if he's tired, if he's taken drugs or some other medication, and if there's poor visibility. There's, those will all increase the distance he travels while he's thinking, which is called thinking distance. Braking is all about the car, the condition of the car and the road. So wet roads, drown too fast, tires and brakes worn out, icy roads, the effect of the car, tires, brakes will all contribute to a longer braking distance. Add the two distances together, gives you the overall stopping distance of the car. Bringing force and momentum together, again, this is just for higher. Newton's second law of motion says the force acting on an object is its rate of change in momentum. In other words, to get something to stop or to start, you can work out the force needed. What it means is, if you want a bigger change in momentum, you're going to need a bigger force. And if you want to do that in a shorter time, you're also going to need a bigger force. The equation here looks complicated for higher, and it is one of the hardest questions you may well get. Back to cars. Let's use Newton's second law to explain how airbags work. Here's an example. So an airbag means that it slows down the time the driver stops. Basically, the change in momentum is the same, because obviously the car has to come to a stop, but it increases the time of the collision, and that time increase means there's less force. Same thing with seat belts. They stretch a little bit, so it increases the time and also crumples in so at the start of the front of the car increases the time, means there's less force and less likely that you sustain injury.